Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage, Mr. Mark Thompson. Hey. Well, this has been so exciting to hear the many different perspectives that we're learning about that are going on and through this great, amazing event here at Silicon Slopes. So far, we've been talking about invention and innovation and disruption. Now we're going to talk about reinvention and a couple of people who have been great reinventors of great brands, people who have been transforming organizations that have so much to contribute in their new way of work and a new way of delivering service are Ryan Napierski and Chandra Kant Patel. Come on out here, guys. Give them a big round of applause from Hewlett Packard and from New Skin. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks for being here. How are you? Good. 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 So I can, I can remember feeling smug for about just 20 minutes at Schwab.com. We had started that company. We were giving the J.D. Powers Quality Award, and, and Gartner said that we were delivering online services in this new world of stock brokerage. And about 90 days later, we were defeated by every measure by other competitors that leapfrogged us. We were not able to hold on to that spot until we had to just chase that next dream of reinvention, thinking about how we could improve what we're doing at it by every measure. So when I think about these two gentlemen, Ryan being at New Skin and your work at HP for all these years, HP, I think about the two inventors in the garage mm -hmm. in Palo Alto, okay. Bill and David, Hewlett and Packard. Okay. Eight decades that firm has been contributing to its own contribution in all the different industries, but 36 months ago, they decided that they'd split that organization in two. And here you are, 30 years at it. Okay. You're a Silicon Valley Hall of Famer, but you had to decide how to reinvent that firm by splitting it into two, to two pieces. Could you talk a little bit about that journey? Yeah, you know, I, I used to personally know Bill Hewlett. And the first time I met him, it was in the lab stock. And I asked Bill, what are you looking for? And he was looking for soldering wire and fasteners. <laughs> but the, uh, the founders the exemplified Fundamentals, simplicity, and humility. And I asked them to join, I asked Bill to join us in, in me in the lab, and he went through my lab notebook with great depth and fundamentals. So we begin with our values of fundamentals, simplicity, and humility. That's where we start. And then the reinvention began three years ago, like you said. And in this context, we are very lucky. We are a cyber physical company. Mm steeped in physical fundamentals, goes back to our instrument days. Mm. And now here we are, 3D printing, art to part. Mm -hmm. Take digital data and print physical things. Extremely physical, overlaid with information science. So we, a cyber physical company, steeped in fundamentals and values of simplicity and humility. With that, we believe it is our time. And that's how we began our reinvention. And when we began our reinvention, we set up a structure whereby I, in my role, also work with our CEO to look at megatrends, the socioeconomic, ecological megatrends that are shaping the world, aging demography, resource constraints. You realized you could print all sorts of things with this technology. <laughs> and, and then what do Medical we devices and 3D. Yeah, or uh, uh, human augmentation in an aging demography a 3D printed part, sustainable, cradle to cradle sustainability with 3D printing. So what we do is in light of these mega trends, we are asking ourselves, what solutions do we bring? So we stay to the, close to our mission of making life good for everyone everywhere while making money. Crossroads of people, profit, planet, and petabytes of data. <laughs> that's, so that's where how we are moving forward, looking very judiciously at mega trends, looking at technology and architecting solutions. And that's how, with that kind of a framework, we have begun the reinvention. You know, when you think about that in the technology and the physical world, you think about health and wellness and all the areas that you're touching at New Skin. And you have a million sales leaders that you're enabling and empowering. Yeah. You're doing that digitally. You're yeah. done, you've done that with e-commerce. Now we have to look at social platforms to do that sort of reinvention and contribution to customers. Yeah. How are you thinking about that self-renewal and contribution using yeah. technology? Well, and people in the audience are probably wondering, why is a skincare company sitting up on a tech summit? And I'll tell you why. I, I, in fact, if we could 3D print yeah. skincare, yeah. there we go. Think there about go. that. 
but I mean, going back to that reinvention question mark, you know, for us, it is about reading the tea leaves or the macro trends that you're talking about and understanding where the world is, is heading. We know that beauty and wellness, they're the top Instagram followed topics. We know that they're, they're very hot uh, in, the, in the marketplace today. Consumers need solutions. Uh, talking about Bill's obsession of the customer, consumers need those solutions. So when we looked out to the future, we saw what was taking place around the gig economy, opportunity com economy, and social commerce. We really looked at our business and said, how will we play in the future? How are we going to reinvent ourselves before the disruption occurs on us? And, and to your point, we operate in 50 countries. We have uh, over a million entrepreneurs on our platform. Uber has three million. We've got to figure out how to beat, beat them. But, but how do we transform our business from a pipeline business, taking products through a channel to end consumers to become a platform and to engage with producers of opportunity and consumers? And so for us, as a human empowerment company, that's really what we're passionate about. Our mission is to do that. That's where we started our, our disruptive transformation efforts and, and how we're now taking it through uh, skincare, wellness, and, and into other opportunities as we go. What do you think is going to be the shakeout around the gig economy? Because yeah. these are platforms like yours that are enable people to become entrepreneurs in a second. That yeah. You have all the tools. Yeah. It's a place like Lyft or Amazon. That's right. Talk about what it really means to enable a, a gig economy. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, there are all kinds of studies out there, right? McKinsey, I read one just the other day that said, McKinsey says by 2023, 67% of the U.S. workforce will be independently contracting it at some level. You look at Apple, who paid $36 billion, is in independent developer commissions last year alone. I mean, it is, it, it's a, ma a major mega trend. Uh, that, that's occurring, we look at it to say the world needs opportunity. The world absolutely needs opportunity. Traditional employment is changing. Uh, how do we, and by the way, outside of Utah and the US, it's even more dramatic when we look at Southeast Asia or China or India, Africa. How do we enable people to have more opportunity? The gig economy is just playing off of the consumer need for greater freedom and flexibility. Companies like Uber, TaskRabbit, Amazon, SMB are all built to, to service this growing opportunity sector. Our question is how do we play in that? Mm -hmm. When you think about that opportunity platform and, the, and yeah. that disruption, how do you pull together a sales force globally? Both of you have to work with people across continents, time zones. You want them to start to be able to reinvent themselves. Right. How do they break through the natural resistance that, that people yeah. have to change? I think they, well, I mean, from my point of view, the minute, I mean, it's human psychology. The minute you show them a bigger picture of what the world will be and how they play in it, I think they come along pretty quickly. That's my view, but. So, I don't know. Our, uh, much similar, in our case, we look at the value we are delivering. So if a customer of a 3D printed part, what is the value we are delivering? And we can do some unique contours and designs with 3D printed part. Mm. So when you put it in your system, you have a lower pressure drop, you use lesser power, how will it help the electric car? So you have to not only realize that you can print part on demand, but you can also realize you, you are in the realm of possibilities that didn't exist. And those possibilities will drive value in your business, mm. reduce cost, operate more efficiently. Our conversations tend to be very much along those lines. So therefore, the front end must be well versed in physical understanding of what we do, physical sciences, and they must also be very well versed in information sciences. So the front end must have that level of conversation. So we start to think from the front end all the way to the back end. What are we delivering? We are trying to deliver customer success in that way, and how do we train them? What have you learned as leaders of this reinvention? What, what do you wish you knew at the beginning of your career about leading people through creative transformation that you've started to learn from the fits and starts and struggle of trying to reinvent great brands today? What, what do you wish you knew as, a, as an individual leader? I wish I knew technology. I mean, you know, in, as, as a bit of a joke, I mean, I, I spent the last 15 years out of the US living in Europe or, or in Japan came back a year and a half, two years ago to, to then lead this company, as, which is a skincare company here in Utah. And by the way, I'm driving down the I-15 corridor and I'm seeing the number of technology businesses, right, that are 
lining both sides of it. And I realized really quickly as we started to do our PEST and our SWOT analyses on long-term strategy that every company today is a technology company. It truly is. Every company out there, whether we're selling goods or services or whether we're platforms, we're all, we're all technology companies. And so for me, I would go back to school instead of studying marketing, I think I would be studying engineering like, like our friend here. I, I think, but I think having those, those basic design level thinking principles, first principles, and, and basing our knowledge and our development on that is, is something I would double down on. And now I'm doubling down on it with you and with others, trying to, to learn and be that perpetual learner, picking up the skills that we need to lead a business into the next decade and, and century, I hope. Mm, when I think about the, the rich history that you both had growing up as you did and deciding later then to go to Berkeley and become the engineer and, and now in the Silicon Valley Hall of Fame. And if you think about the leadership lessons, the role that you sure. play as a coach to inspire people, right. what do you wish you knew? Uh, I, I, I always ask, you know, it was in fact December where many children were applying to universities and I wrote a piece on LinkedIn called Passion and Point of View. So I ask every young person to articulate their point of view. Mm. And uh, in, like, just like I said, in light of the mega trends, here I, here's how I think the world will shape up. Then I want to ask them to articulate their passion. Life sciences, bioengineering will be big because of aging demography, etc. Then I ask them, then we sit down together to create a, a sort of a, a visual path of where, what, what path they could undertake. So for me, it always begins with socioeconomic, ecological megatrends, point of view, passion, and then great depth in fundamentals. I am paranoid about forgetting mechanical engineering as I learned in Berkeley 40 years ago. So I continue to teach every day. I teach drafting, I've done CAD, CAE. So great depth in what I learned, breadth in areas like information science, machine learning, AI, so become a T-shaped individual. I ask all young people to become T-shaped individual. And I, and I like to be as well versed as this colleague of mine in global knowledge and business acumen. So, so I think we, we can learn from each other, right? So technology, fundamentals, T-shaped individual with breadth of knowledge. If you're going to be pushing the envelope, you're going to fail. All great experiments that lead to innovation require failure. What has been your biggest setback that you had to recover from in that journey? I, I developed a control system that was state of the art. It will take data from thousands of sensors and do actuators at these scales. We could build it, we could deploy it, it was hard to scale. So cyber physical solutions like smart buildings and collecting data and controlling things are very hard to scale. So the biggest lesson I learned is technologies you create must be so scalable that you don't need to send somebody to configure anything. The minute somebody has to walk in and put sensors in this room, forget it. <laughs> I, I know how many people are in the room by just looking at their network logs. The occupancy can be told because they're all connected to Wi-Fi. Why do I need a sensor? <laughs> Each of them is 100 watts, so I add them up and control the air conditioning. That's a scalable <laughs> and What? Are you comfortable, everyone? Yeah, 100 watts. If, if you were on the it treadmill, you'd be 300 watts. <laughs> but they're not on a treadmill. Why do I need sensors? See, this is, we are over-provisioning with sensors and creating this Jetsonian utopian world that does not scale. Think fundamentally simple. Simplicity, humility, fundamentals. I think that those fundamentals are the ones that really guide reinvention. Can we give these gentlemen a big round of applause for being the reinventors in their great industry? Thanks, great job. Yes, Appreciate ladies and gentlemen, job. big round of applause for our panelists again. Thank you for coming to Silicon Slopes Tech Summit.